Hey everybody, welcome into another edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Check. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. Tony and Jackie here with Andy Martinez. And Andy, we're sitting here on the six-year anniversary of the Cubs winning the 2016 World Series. Obviously, we're recording a bit before, but if you're listening to it, it is on the six-year anniversary, November 2nd. As many, including at Obvious Shirts, say the greatest game ever played was on a Wednesday in Cleveland. So, Andy, as you think about it, as, as you go back to the 2016 World Series, which, by the way, we'll hear a little later on from Ron Coomer, the hometown hero who who called the World Series game with Pat Hughes on the radio. You know, a guy who played for the Cubs in the past and obviously grew up playing in this area as well. So great conversation there. But, Andy, as we sit here at, on coming up on the anniversary what stood out to you about the game and like, where were you for game seven? What stood out to me about, about it is kind of what you said. I mean, it, the, the game had everything, right? There was crazy, you know, question, seconding, second decision guessing on, on decisions. Whoa, should he have done that? Should he have, you know, maybe pulled that? Should he have gone to John? Should he kept John Lester? And you did so many different what ifs that you start pondering as you're watching that game. And then the Jason Kipnis, uh, whatever you want to call it, almost home run, almost extra base hit. That was the moment where I think you kind of think, oh, oh my gosh, the, like maybe there there's something there. And then the, the Rajai Davis home run, there's, I mean, that game had everything. I could keep going just on little moments that happened that that, that, that game had. But where I was, I was actually working at a newspaper design center. So I was designing newspaper covers and citing era, different pages. And so it's actually kind of the cooler places to be outside of actually being there because we were on deadline and the game, the rain delay was actually kind of the worst thing that could have happened for deadlines because everyone's waiting. All these newspapers across the country are waiting for the result. You know, either it's going to be a historic victory for the Cubs or, or Cleveland. One of these franchises is going to break a curse and, and they wanted the, the sports page and their newspapers to reflect that. So we had deadlines that were staggered. They didn't stagger that night because there, everyone was waiting for the result of this game. And then that rain delay happened and it kind of gave everyone in the newsroom a little breather because we were just waiting for this game. And we were so hectic trying to have Cleveland wins the world series Cubs win the world series, whatever, uh, as a different scenarios for, for different newspapers. It was, it was so busy, so crazy. I vividly remember there were so many Cubs fans in the newsroom when they won that they were excited, but it was also kind of like, cool, they won. Now we got to crank out, you know, all these pages and all these different, different covers. It was, it was a blur of a night after, after the final hours are recorded. I, I didn't watch any of the post game stuff until the next day, just because I was so busy after that, but it was, it was very, very memorable for sure. So Andy went at the newspaper, like how did the first or the days leading up to that work? Like, you know, the, um, October 30th, where the Cubs pull off the win in game five. And, you know, the series is going back to Cleveland. And then, you know, the day off on Halloween, where I know a bunch of Cubs players like trick-or-treated and stuff too with their kids. But then game six too, like not knowing what was going to happen. How did that work, like you said, from a newspaper and deadline perspective? Yeah, so it was very much, there, we had papers all across the countries where there was papers in Ohio, there was papers in New York, there was papers in California. And the papers in, in Ohio, in the Midwest especially, there was a lot of we had specialty sections planned for the Cleveland Cleveland wins the World Series. Uh, just the, the matter of the business, you have to plan for, for that. And in that situation, when the team's up three one, you know you're thinking tomorrow or maybe the next day Cleveland breaks their their slump. And reversely, you're kind of thinking the Cubs. It's another year. What happens? What happens next? They're they're not going to they're not going to win the World Series. What's so planning all these specialty sections of the Cubs lose the World Series? What does it mean? pictures of the history of the drought, the the Billy Goat, you know, the the black cat, all those things, having sections like that planned out. It was it was absolutely insane. And then that that last game, it's okay, we have to be prepared for everything. It's it was kind of like election night, uh, in the sense that it was, all right, you have to have a plan for if this guy wins, if this person wins, anything in between. And come when it came to it, we kind of had to throw a lot of things out because the, the game just kind of dictated it that way. Yeah. I mean, I remember specifically like just thinking about during game six, you know, and, and being back in Cleveland and thinking about the, the magnitude and the gravity of a game seven that was 
I, I can't imagine a baseball game with higher stakes than that one. Winner take yeah. all of the two longest droughts in Major League Baseball in, in history, really, at the yeah. time, um, just because the Red Sox and White Sox had already won previously and then the decade or so prior to that. But yeah, I mean, the Cubs at 108 years, I think the Indians were at 68 ish around that, that time. So, I mean, you know, just the two longest droughts in general. So, you know, that one of these teams is going to be ending it. And then the fact that it's a game seven, which is always incredibly exciting. It's winner take all, you know, it was, it really was just incredible. And I, the game lived up to it. And I, I just think back to, like you were saying, Andy, that it had everything. I mean, two runners scored on a wild pitch right after John Lester and David Ross came in the game that hit off Ross's mask and he kind of like staggered and fell and bounced so far away that the runner on second scored in addition to the guy on third. And like you're thinking, okay, is this a cubby occurrence? And same with the Rajay Davis homer. But then, you know, like you said, the homer that wasn't the Jason Kipnis homer down the line or what at least would have been an extra base hit, you know, that he pulled pretty close to, to being fair. And I remember seeing that from my vantage point, so where I was in Cleveland, the auxiliary press box was high in right field. It was We were pretty much even with the right fielder. And, and maybe if he was playing shallow, like in between where like Jason Hayward was playing and the right field foul pole. And we were outside. I remember thinking like off the bat, from our perspective, you could tell it was going foul. So I didn't think it was that big of a deal. But I remember seeing everybody on like Twitter and social media and had like friends texting me and stuff that was like, oh, I thought that was it. Like I thought they were going to win it. So it was a really interesting perspective to see like that Kipnis um, thing. It didn't stand out much in my head because I, I kind of saw the angle immediately versus on TV. It really looked like it could have been a home run or was close to it. So there were so many of those like pivotal moments. And then I think what stood out to me too was just the weather. Like it was 72 yeah. degrees for game six and seven in November in Cleveland. When I remember games one and two in Cleveland were freezing. It was like fifties or sub fifties by the time the game started. And I was freezing in the auxiliary press box, like outside. Cause you're essentially in the upper deck. Whereas for game six and seven, I was wearing like a light jacket. It was, it was just great. Yeah. And the, the other thing too, is you mentioned the cubby occurrence. I remember even watching it on TV the, the last out to Chris Bryant where his leg kind of slips, my immediate reaction, quick, really quick thought is, oh my gosh, he's going to slip and overthrow. And, and we're going to keep going just because of how that game had gone on. To me, that was, and every time I watch it, there's always a part of me that thinks, oh, this is, this time he's, I, it's, it's a replay, but I'm like, this time, this time he's going to slip. It just feels like that's going to happen just because of how that game went. And, and then obviously the final out happens and it was, it, it, I mean, yeah, that game had everything. It, it was just an unbelievable game seven. If you're gonna, if you're gonna break a curse, I mean, there's no better game to to do it, or there's no better way to do it in that sense. No, I agree 100. percent I've asked Cubs fans that often in the last six years of like, really, what what more could you add to to the gravity of the moment than going down three one in the World Series, having you know your back against the wall, like knowing that you were probably not going to sweep at Wrigley anyways. And obviously once they lost game three, that was like guaranteed that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so yeah. So pushing them to the limit and just getting to this point, like I can't think of a better way to write the ending of that, of that 108 year curse or drought or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, I just think it was really fantastic in a lot of ways. I mean, such an incredible fall. And honestly that, that winter I watched the game in its entirety again, like from a TV perspective, I haven't yet since then. So I haven't seen it like from beginning to end. I've seen highlights, obviously, like you said, the Chris Bryant play and, and, you know, all these other things that Fowler lead off Homer. I've seen that a bunch of times, but I'm, I'm going to sit down and watch like, you know, from first pitch to final out again here, you know, for this anniversary. And I just think it's really cool. And on that note too, like Ron Coomer said the same thing. And we had this awesome chat with him that, you know, he lived it live, obviously, calling the game for the radio, but then he never watched it on TV until recently when he came into the Marquee Sports Network studios, did something for, the, you know, the re-air that we're going to have uh, on November 2nd here as you're listening to it. And then we got to chat with him a little bit for the podcast. So that was a really fun conversation, and uh, we'll take a listen to that right now. All right, we're joined by Ron Coomer now on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. And Coom, I know you just watched Game 7 again recently. We're coming up on the six-year anniversary of was probably the favorite game of almost every Cubs fan. What what emotions went through you as you watched the game and just kind of like what was that experience like for you? It was it was interesting. And thanks for having me on first of all, sure. but it's um it was one of those things where 
you remember it, but you don't remember all the little details, right? Until you, you know, you start reliving how the day started in the morning from doing shows and all the stuff that goes on to the game itself and the pregame and, and then thinking about the the words you want to use actually in the game because it, quite frankly we we're all a little nervous it's game seven of the world series and you know for chicago we haven't had too many games of the world <laughs> series so and me growing up across the street at wrigley field as a kid coming to games i knew the importance of it and so did pat for that matter and i think uh you know for pat hughes and i i think we were both a little nervous but in a good way like it was a it was a good nervous but it was um Great to relive, um, yes, you know, just rewatch, and all and all that went on. It was it was really fun. You mentioned things that you you kind of forget. What specifically did you forget? Because, you know, when you I feel like when I've rewatched it, I'm like, oh yeah, this happened or that happened. There are little things um, at certain at bats, right? Um, watching through the years now of, of talking to Kyle Hendricks, and then you know I got a chance to listen to Pat. And then also listen to Johnny Smoltz talk about Kyle. And now Kyle's a 25-year-old kid at the yeah. time, you know. This is a few years ago. And the poise that Kyle had and just watching him pitch Game 7 of the World Series, um, I, I would say this, it'd be a good thing for Kyle to go back and watch. Yeah, I really think that's it's something, you know, for him to go see because it was impressive. But um, little things, certain at-bats, um, certain things um, – Anthony talking about his emotions in the dugout because Rossi was mic'd up. Um, and, you know, and Tony, we all know, he, you know, he always had the emotions right on his sleeve and here we go and, you know, and, and all those things. And then um, certain pitches, I think, that uh, changed the game. I watched it for a second, third time um, and then just watched it, obviously, yesterday. And, boy, they, you know, tough ball game for both sides you could look back and go what if uh, if that uh, you know and all those things and I remember doing that as a broadcaster you know and it's it's intense but it was great how many times have you seen it now like I, you know I've, I've been watching as we at Marquee Sports mm-hmm. Network have, have re-aired all the wins from that postseason and I think back I don't remember after 2016 watching some of those games in its entirety again so I'm curious from your perspective, like, have you watched them again? Have you watched Game 7 again? Like, how often have you seen that? I have listened to it twice. Okay. So um, that next Christmas, uh, I was driving, and the scorer played it. Yeah. So I listened to the to Pat and I's broadcast, and that was chills, right? Oh, it was so close, though, it just happening. You know, we're two months out from it. So that was entertaining. And then uh, we did a, a show during COVID time, Pat and I, where we, you know, talked about all the playoff games and, and where, you know, there are the specific ones. And um, so I've got to listen to it. But actually watch the game. I watched it yesterday for the first time. Wow. wow. Where I actually watched the entire game. You know, we've all seen snippets of yeah, it. Right, yeah, right. You guys a lot yeah, right yeah. here. But, you know, but but that was it. It was, it was, it was fun to watch. And... Um, and relive some of it, yeah. So that final out happens, and yeah. and Pat Hughes makes his wonderful call. When you're going Did into that... Did he make a call on it? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I can't <laughs> remember. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking no, of it I, wrong. I, I, I think you're right. I'm He's repeated it once or twice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're thinking about that day, you mentioned the nerves. Did you think about what a potential Pat Hughes final call could be like and what your role would be in that? Absolutely. That was uh, very heavy on me and I didn't really share that with anybody but you know the, I understand being a baseball fan and someone who played for a long time I mean and then you know broadcasting a long time this has never happened right we've never had the call of the Cubs win the World Series yeah. we haven't had that right so um, one of my good friends who was Pat's partner before me Ron Sano would always yell yeah. while Pat was calling, you know, there's a dry, you know, ball, kid's got a chance, and Ronnie would start yelling, and it was just chaos. Or the, oh, no. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. So we've seen that and heard that, and I just, I really didn't, I, I never want that to happen in, you know, game 100. 
But Game 7 of the World Series, um, I actually moved the microphone out of my face. A, I could see what was going on a little better even. But I absolutely didn't want to step on his call because I knew the importance of it. And then I also knew how good it would be. Right, Pat? He's, yeah. he's got a way. You know, there's only a few people in our, in our game that have been able to capture things like you just, where does that come from, right? Yeah. And it's, it just comes out. Vin Scully was one. We all know Vinny. Yeah. And boom, it would just come out and you're like, where did that yeah. come from? Because it's not scripted. Right. You didn't know Gibson was going to hit a home run there, right? right? No right. One, Pat, the ground ball to Bryant. And then, you know, and Pat makes a call and you're like, well, that's not scripted. I know it's not. Yeah. We're sitting there together. Right, right. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to screw up that call by by saying anything um, over the top of him. Like, let's say that. What do you remember feeling in that moment? Because, like you said, you know, growing up, going to games here, but also a baseball fan, having played for the franchise, and you understood the impact yeah. of it. What do you remember feeling, and and how tough was it maybe to like you know be the broadcaster and feel the emotions and try to live in the moment and do your job all at the same time? It was tough. I think it was tough for all of us, right? Um, how would you say? I a it was so intense. Yeah. Be you know we have the rain delay, and then the Cubs take the lead, you know, and and the inning ends, and then you know the bottom half of the tenth. Uh, that was really intense. Like, you could just cut it. The whole stadium, you know, Jacob said you could cut it with a knife. The whole ballpark, the booth itself, you could just feel it. And then as you're watching in the monitor in our booth, shots of the fans, whether it be Cub fans or Cleveland fans, you just see it on their face. And, and I'm like, that's us too. We're <laughs> feeling the same way. Uh, so you, I understood, you know, and I was feeling it as being a, a kid as a Cub fan. Um, signing here to be a Cub and wanting to be that guy that was helping change that, um, change the history of the franchise, you know, and, and the, the GOAT and get rid of all of those those issues that we've had here. Uh, but I, and then I was just really happy I was there and, and able to help call it. Um, I thought that was really, really cool and emotional, cool, fun, um, and uh I guess rewarding. I guess for all for all that were involved, not just me, but everybody. I just thought, whew, it's over. We did it. Yeah. Has it ever settled in your place in history that you were the first broadcaster, radio broadcaster, to call a Cubs World Series? Well, we're about to do this show here. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it will tonight. I don't know. Uh, it has a little bit, you know, especially on days like today, uh, yesterday, watching the game um, and just. Uh, this past week um, with Marquis, you're, yeah. you're going through the game or the 2016 playoff time. Um, and, you know, it's Saturday afternoon. It's a little, you know, rainy outside. You're thumbing through and there it is. And you're like, oh, well, let's just watch. Right? Yeah. It's a good time to get a glass of wine and just sit in front and, and, and hang out and watch. Right. And that's what I did. So it was uh, it was fun to relive that. And I, I do. You do feel that. Um, there's no one else that's ever done that. Yeah, and it, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. Through all that fall, and like you said, you're rewatching the games. But you know, the the DS against the Giants, the CS against yeah. the Dodgers. Was there ever a moment where you thought, or even really even early in the season, was there a moment that you thought this team is destined to do this? And then on the on the contrary, was there other ever a moment where you're like, you know what, I don't know that they're going to do this. Uh, obviously being down 3-1 in the World Series or, you know, what was it, 21 straight innings without scoring before Zobra's bunt started things off. Like, was there ever a moment on either end of the spectrum where you thought, yes, it's going to happen or no, it's not going to happen? I think both. Yeah. I really do. Uh, early in the year, right away, I mean, the first month of the season, the Cubs went on a great stretch. They had a great April. Um, they were leading the division by five games, six yeah. games when the month ended. Um went out on the West Coast and just dominated the West Coast right away. And you just don't do that. You finish 500 on the West Coast, all, all good, right? You're happy. It's good. We're good. Um, that wasn't the case. Cubs blew through the West Coast, came back home, uh, played great baseball. So as the season was moving on, you thought, wow, this is really a good team. And the bullpen was doing its job. The rotation was outstanding. Um and then the Cubs acquired Chapman, and I thought, wow, the one missing piece. 
they've added, and they added the best one, right? He used the best in baseball. So that was really good. Um, all yes, thinking this team's going to, this is, this is the team that could do this. Then you flip forward to the playoffs, and you go to San Francisco, and I remember being down, I think it was 4-1 to one in that game, um, and if the Cubs didn't win that game, they were going to have to play game five, I believe it was, with Cueto pitching on the mound, and I thought, ooh, that could, we've seen that, that played out. We had one hit in the seventh inning was a basket shot here that Javi hits, and that wins the game. That's it. That's the only run scored in the game. Um, and I think it was, was it Jake and Cueto or Johnny and Cueto? That Johnny, Johnny and yeah. Cueto matched up. No one was hitting. Yeah. And both guys were at the top of their game. They just were. And I thought that game could go either way. And that was scary to me to go back, even though it was here, to go back and play a game. I, I thought, mm, that's not good. But it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. Kind of off that, Rajai Davis's home run in game seven in the eighth. What's going through your head, both as a broadcaster, but both as you're following Can this team? Can we actually say it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Rajay Davis home run, I, you know, the one thing that fans don't remember, um, it tied the game, right? Yeah. So it ties the game. It doesn't put Cleveland ahead. It ties the game. And I, I still, even though it was like a gut punch to the extreme, it still only tied the game. And so in that regard, it was good. Um, and then the momentum changed with, with the rain delay or just kind of shut things down a little bit. But um, I, I thought Chapman coming in and getting the next inning and getting three outs and then the rain delay came, I felt good because I, I just felt like Cubs were a better team. Yeah. They, they were just a more well-rounded team. They had offensive guys that could do damage to weather played a huge factor, not just the rain, but it was warm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Cubs were a power-hitting team, and the ball was flying. Yeah. So one swing of the bat could, you know, and the Cubs had some good chances. So I was still positive, even though that one was – I'm glad I didn't say what I was thinking at that <laughs> moment, put it that way on the air. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the rain delay. During that 17-minute rain delay, like, what did you do? I remember – all I can remember barely was like in the auxiliary press box, moving my right. laptop in, and then it was like, oh, the rain delay is done. So it seemed super quick to me, but I'm curious how long it felt to you and what did you do during that time? We didn't do anything. I think if I remember correctly, we sat in the booth and uh, we started talking amongst ourselves. I think we had to fill a little bit, um, just, just to, nothing major, but just, you know, talk about the game, which it is game seven of the World Series. Yeah. We've got plenty to talk about. Uh, and I don't think we did much. And then... I felt like because that front looked worse than it actually turned out to be, I thought we were looking at a couple hours. Yeah. And when I, I saw John Hirschbeck go back onto the field you know, quickly and, and start talking to the managers, I'm like, this is going to be over. He, he, one of two things, either we're going to play tomorrow or we're done and it's, we're going to start. And, yeah. Sure enough, we started right back up. It was amazing how quick that was. I mean, how many rain delays do you see in Major League Baseball that are that short? You just don't see it. Even, even less than 40 minutes, really. Like by the time you get the tarp on and yeah, then off, right, it's, yeah, right. that takes 20 yeah. plus minutes in itself. So. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Wintrust. And when we come back, we'll have more from Ron Coomer revisiting Game 7. Get your Wintrust exclusive debit card. Get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one. How much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with Wintrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your Wintrust Cubs debit card. $300? What? I'll take a $300. $300? Get your exclusive card at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Is, is there something about Game 7 that you don't think is talked about enough? I know we talked. We, we, you mentioned some of the at-bats, but is there a moment that you know, maybe gets overlooked a little bit? That's a good question. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, we, we, you know, in sports, we, we analyze and <laughs> analyze some more and then really analyze it and go back. So, 
you know, to say there's things that aren't talked about, um, some adjustments made by really young players. I, I thought um, Javi making an adjustment at the plate after making two errors early in the game was not easy, especially for him. That wasn't his game to hit the ball the other way, and he did it. Uh, Contreras being a young, young player, um, starting in Game 7 of the World Series after being a minor leaguer most of the year, right? That was a big deal. Um, the one thing I, I felt like going into that game where I felt really comfortable for the Cubs, and it turned out to be the case, but this is where baseball, you know, the inner workings of our game and being a player and you start talking in amongst yourselves when you're going into a ball game. I thought the Cubs had a huge advantage going into that game because Kluber was pitching on short rest for the second time. Not one time, but twice. And he's a great pitcher, and he's had a great career um, still. But you pitch that many games in one series on short rest for the second time in a row, I thought that was asking a lot. But that was the advantage the Cubs had. When they won game five, the advantage, it, it, it flipped to the Cubs because now their starting pitching was running out of gas. The bullpen was good, but their starters were running out of gas, and the Cubs weren't. They hadn't pitched anybody on short rest. After the final out, I mean, and we talked about, you know, like mm -hmm. you push the microphone away, yeah, but yeah. like you're off the air. You and Pat yeah. are off the air. Did you take some time to celebrate and like what would you do then the rest of the night? And when do you kind of, when do you think it like set in or realize that like, oh my God, the Cubs just won the World Series? Yeah, we, we definitely celebrated. Yeah. There's no doubt about <laughs> I'm sure. that. We, the celebration was on. <laughs> uh, I will say this. I don't know how she did it, but my wife, Paula, um, got through security, yeah. did not have a pass, <laughs> got through security from the field, and got up to the booth, which, you know, it's not like, you know, she's me going through security. She's this little thing. Um, she ended up hooking up with with uh, Eddie Vedder, Bill Murray, and I think Chelios. I think the three of them. Wow. Where she got on an elevator to get up that way, and I think she had them around us, so she kind of, got her way through to get to a certain level where she could get to our booth. But right away, she got to the booth as the game, as our celebration of talking began with Pat and I. Yeah. Very tough to talk. We were all a mess, <laughs> you know, every one of us. Even a couple of people in our booth might have been Sox fans, but they're, you know, rooting for the Cubs too. Even they were a mess, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Um, but she had a, a W flag. Okay. With, with her. Yeah. So Pat and I got a picture right after the World Series ended of us holding a W flag in the booth with the scoreboard in the background at the Cubs or World Series champs. I thought that was um, really cool. And then, you know, the other thing, um, Len Casper did a great job. Obviously, Pat and I, we were talking and, you know, we're, we're going back and forth and we're going to, you'll see this, but it was great and very emotional. Len did a great job on the field of getting interviews with guys. Um, and then once that started dying down a little bit, I wanted to get the hell out of there. I'm like, we got to go to the clubhouse. <laughs> it's time to drink champagne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to the clubhouse. And Pat was, well, you know, he's, he didn't like overstepping his bounds. And then I'm like, not today. We're going. <laughs> and so Pat Hughes, uh, Mitch Rosen, and Ron Coomer, we, hit, we shot down to the clubhouse. We say hi to everybody out in front of the clubhouse doors. We go in, open the door, and to our left, Joe Madden's office door was slightly open, and I looked in, and everybody was in the clubhouse pouring champagne, and the trophy was right there. Right. Got to take a shot. Right? Oh, so, yeah. So we took pictures with the trophy before we went <laughs> into the clubhouse. So we got pictures with the trophy. Probably not what we were supposed to do, but we did it anyway. You know, the old... Uh, Ask for forgiveness there, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think it applies there. And then we went in, and I, you know, we started. Uh, I grabbed the bottle of champagne, and Tim Buss, our strength coach then, who was a real good friend, started pouring champagne over me and me on him. And then Tom Ricketts, our owner, Mr. Ricketts is there, and he's talking to me. We're hugging. I can't see him because Tim Buss is pouring so much <laughs> champagne in our face, and the party was on from there. It was good. It was really good. What was the parade like? You know, obviously the party in, in Cleveland's fun. The, the parade, I mean, it's one of the largest gatherings, yeah. human gatherings in history. Um, funny, 
because I trying to get to Wrigley Field from downtown Chicago was not easy. Yeah. Um, driving, it just wasn't. All the streets were closed. And I'm driving, and I, finally I just said, we got to – I just pulled up to a barricade, and he got, you kick it. And I rolled down the window. I go, I'm in the parade. <laughs> he goes – Coop, move it. <laughs> I'm driving down a street about three blocks from Wrigley Field, down the middle of the street, and there's fans everywhere. And I'm going the wrong way down a one-way street, going the other, and yeah, and that's, so I was zigzagging through the city. All the streets were blocked off, and they were letting me through to get to Wrigley, so that was pretty cool. But the parade was incredible. I'm, You know, getting on the buses um, was, you know, unworldly, I mean. You just think about all the people that were there and, and waving. And and I'd never been a part of that. We never, you know, I'd been in the playoffs before. We didn't win. As a Yankee, we lost to, to Joe's Anaheim team. So I'd never been a part of that. And it was pretty, it was incredible. All the people that were there. And then you got to the park and, you know, Grand Park. And it was just packed full of people. And um, it, was, it was an amazing day. That was incredible how many people were there, wasn't it? Just amazing. Zooming back a bit, you know, just your career, obviously being able to broadcast, you know, for your hometown team, but then also being able to play for a year for your mm -hmm. hometown team. Is that like a bucket list type of opportunity for you? And just broad scale, like how much does it mean to you to be able to work in Chicago with the Cubs on a daily basis and, it, and to have played here? Yeah, it, it's, it's worked out twice. Uh, almost similarly as a player and then as a broadcaster. Um, I loved Minnesota. I was playing there and I was doing well as a player. And, you know, I was up for free agency. It didn't work out in Minnesota. I thought it was gonna. I didn't think I'd be a free agent, but I ended up being a free agent. And the, literally within the first two hours of free agency, Andy McPhail had a contract sent to the house um, from the Cubs. So I knew I, I was going to not <laughs> eventually work that out. Yeah. My dad had some choice words for me, like, don't screw this up, kind of. <laughs> uh, you're coming home to play. Um, so that was one of those things. Um, so I came home to play as a player. And I, I really, once I got a deal from the Cubs, I, there was no other team. And, you know, There were other teams, but there weren't any other teams. I wasn't going to go anywhere else other than to come here. And then as a broadcaster, um, kind of caught me out of left field a little bit because the radio job had become available. And I really thought that, you know, and there was, there was a long, long list of people applying for the job, wanting the job and talking about the job. And I really hadn't. I just signed a new contract with the Twins and radio, TV, the, the team itself, uh, you know, and I was really entrenched there. But I'm literally doing a music show, and my phone rings, and I look at it while I'm on the air, and it's Pat Hughes. Within 24 hours, I was in Chicago <laughs> interviewing with Crane Kenny and, and uh, Jimmy DeCastro, and, uh, and once again, I, you know, I got on a plane to come here, and, you know, my wife said, um, Paula, she goes, you're going to get this job. You know that, right? Or going back to Chicago. I go, you don't know that. She goes, I know that. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's see. And sure enough, um, I don't think it took two days. And, you know, they had to work out some of the details. There's that contract thing that has to be done. Too, <laughs> yeah, but, for sure, sure. You know, as far as I was concerned, it was like, yeah, just, just it's somewhere, anywhere in the vicinity. And I didn't want to tell them that, but, you know, it worked out yeah. pretty good. <laughs> kind of on the heels of that, you mm -hmm. mentioned your, your dad. For, for yeah. you, when you signed as a player, to be able to come home where your family was going to, what did that mean to you? Awesome. Um, yeah, that's just, you know, all my buddies and your friends, even though I grew up on the south side of the city, I had a lot of friends that were Cub fans, right? And, and they were both. And, but just to be back in, in close, you know, contact with all your family and your buddies and your friends and, and my, you know, my high school and everything else, you know, you don't get to do that in our business all that often, right? So I had been gone, literally, you know, since I was 30. Three thirty-two when I signed with the Cubs. So I left Chicago at 18 to go to school and never came back, other than short periods of time. So long period of time had mm -hmm. elapsed that I hadn't been home other than for a month at the most. 
And uh, now I'm home and back playing. So I thought uh, it was, uh, you know, to put the Cubs uniform on, that was about as good as it gets. Yeah. So we see you with the World Series ring on now. And of I know I've seen, I've seen you with it before. I uh-huh. mean, I, obviously, if I had one, I would rock right? it all the time, too. But just, like, take yourself back to 18-year-old Ron Coomer. Do you ever oh. think you would get a Cubs World Series ring in any capacity? No, probably not. I, when you live here in our town, right, and you're, and you're a baseball, I mean, I was baseball inside and out. And, and all of us that play, you know, across the street, whether you're a visitor or a, or a home team player, that's who you are. You're a baseball player, right? That's what you're, it's what you're, you're made of. It's your being. And you always have these dreams. I think that's the great thing about being in our business is you're around people that don't take no for an answer. They're dreamers, and they're willing to put the effort in to make the dream come true, right? So we all dream, right? That's that's who we are. So you always have that in the back of your mind that this could happen. Do you really think you're going to end up calling Game 7 in the World Series? You know, but you always hope and wish. And and uh, I wear I wear my ring a lot, way more than anybody else that's involved, I would think, Um because when I go to places that kids are there, I think it's important to show them some of that. I think it's it's great for our kids in our area. I think it's great for people to see that, you know, the guy they played Little League with, you know, he he was in the World Series and called Game 7. I think it's important. Well, Coom, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciated reliving yeah. this with you yeah. and hearing your perspective through it all. Yeah, thank you, guys. It's uh, been a, a fun time, to kind of relive what happened quite a while ago. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks, Ron. All right, that was a great chat with Ron Coomer, and it's always fun to relive Game 7 and arguably the greatest moment in Cubs franchise history. So we appreciate you listening and tuning in. That'll do it for this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. Catch you next week.